Though catchy and comical, we don't want another scenario as the one portrayed in Love and Dare's Wild Gilbert. While we have no control of the occurrence of a hurricane, we can lessen its impact on our lives through strategic planning. And this episode of Jamaica Magazine will get you into the preparation mode. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm your host, Adrian Atkinson. The show starts right now. Hurricanes can strike at any time. In the event of one, be prepared to act quickly. If a hurricane watch or warning has been issued, review your home disaster response plan. Map out likely routes to evacuate if your home is at risk and confirm with relatives or friends you plan to stay with. Also, confirm the location of the nearest shelter. Check your emergency supplies and restock if necessary. Remember, disasters do happen, so be prepared. Good day, I'm Stacey Ann Smith and this is your GIS News for Monday, May 26. Starting this week, the Education Ministry will be sending schools a master list of supplementary textbooks for grades 1 to 9. This follows Minister Ronald Thwaites' recent announcement that only textbooks approved by his ministry should be given to parents for purchases. The Education Ministry is reminding parents that they should only be paying about $5,000 when buying additional textbooks for students in grades 1 to 6 and $12,000 for grades 7 to 9. Parents should consult the Ministry of Education's website for a list of the approved textbooks. Phase 1 of the Isaac Barrant Center of Excellence was completed and the health center reopened to Eastern St. Thomas residents. The building housing the health center was renovated at a cost of $25 million sourced from the National Health Fund. Isaac Barrant is the third of four centers of excellence to be opened after completing Phase 1 of the planned works. The fourth, Claremont, is close to completion. The setting up and running of these centers of excellence is part of a larger scheme to make Jamaica the health hub for the Caribbean and a major player in the Americas. The Centers of Excellence are expected to offer enhanced customer service. Among other things, Isaac Barrant is now able to offer some specialist and diagnostic services delivered at the Princess Margaret and Kingston Public Hospitals. The Health Center will get a new operating theater, x-ray and laboratory services, food court and additional parking spaces in phase two of the project. Jamaica has received $718 million in grant funding from the European Union for the final leg of the Jamaica Banana Accompanying Measures program. 2,000 banana and plantain farmers and workers from Portland, St. Thomas, St. Catharines, St. Mary, Clarendon and St. James will benefit from the program over the next four years. The program will administer technical assistance in crop testing and sampling and enhance the development of the fruit's quality, quantity and resilience to diseases. In a message read by Minister Maurice Guy, Agriculture Minister Roger Clark welcomed the program. Through these programs, we will be better able to recover production in the affected areas after a storm, strengthen the resilience of you, the farmers, against future shocks, and provide you with livelihood coping strategies and a more sustainable production method. The final leg of the program will be managed and implemented by the Rural Agricultural Development Authority, the Banana Board and the All Island Banana Growers Association. Jamaica has moved up 54 places on the World Bank Logistics Index, which means the country is considered more investment ready in the global logistics chain. The World Bank 2014 Logistics Performance Index reports that Jamaica has improved significantly in all six indicators over the last two years. In 2012, the World Bank Logistics Index placed Jamaica at 124 out of 160 countries. The country is now ranked at 70. Minister of Industry, Investment and Commerce Anthony Hilton made the disclosure during his contribution to the 2014-2015 sectoral debate recently. This achievement is a single, in a single reporting period is unprecedented. This achievement validates Jamaica's ambition to become the next major global logistics hub. Jamaica scored high marks in several areas, including the efficiency of the clearance process at ports and logistics infrastructure, which speak to the quality of Jamaica's trade and transport-related network. 
Greater cultural exchange and dialogue is being facilitated between Japan and Jamaica through the recent opening of a Japanese exhibition at the National Gallery of Jamaica titled Japan, Kingdom of Characters. The exhibit showcases Japanese modern culture of anime and manga and will be on display at the National Gallery until June 14. The showcase is part of the commemoration of 50 years of Jamaica-Japan diplomatic relations. I will continue to organize many other events throughout the year. And finally, Prime Minister Portia Simpson-Miller has called on the administrators of the Land Administration and Management Program LAMP to provide special concessionary rates for senior citizens using the services. Minister, on behalf of the seniors, I'm going to ask you and your, your uh, officials for the LAMP program to ensure you can do something for the seniors who will be getting the titles for the first time. Something special in terms of a reduction. Mrs. Simpson Miller was speaking at the launch of the 10 year extension of LAMP. She urged Jamaicans to take advantage of the services provided by the program, asserting that LAMP was still the best value for money in land registration services. And that's it for GIS News Today. I'm Stacey Ann Smith. Thank you for watching. It's important to store water during periods of drought. It's even more important to ensure that the water is safe. Boiling and treating your water with bleach are two of the best ways to purify water. If you choose the boiling method, allow the water to boil for five minutes, cover and let it cool. Store boiled water in a clean airtight container and use something with a handle to take out the water when needed. If you use bleach to make your water safe for drinking, Use two drops of bleach to a litre of water, eight drops for a gallon and half teaspoon of bleach for five gallons of water. Shake well and leave for half an hour before use. Water is essential to a healthy life, so ensure yours is clean and safe for consumption. From participating in another productive Labor Day to a tour of the progress being made on the Mount Rosa Bypass, Prime Minister Portia Simpson-Miller and her team were fully occupied this past week. Catch highlights next. Promoting the spirit of self-reliance, Prime Minister gets progress report on Mount Rosa Bypass and physical education and sport included in CAPE electives. With this week's Jamaica House Weekly, I am Samantha Allen. Let us demonstrate that spirit of self-reliance which resides in each and every one of us. Let us go and work on projects in our communities. Prime Minister Portia Simpson-Miller urging Jamaicans to get involved in Labor Day projects last Friday. In a message to the nation, Mrs. Simpson-Miller said Labor Day highlighted the importance of labor in building a nation and transforming a society. Jamaica's beauty is our duty. Let us give our labor of love let us build Jamaica. Help repair the homes of our seniors who might need our assistance. Beautify and improve a school, church, or children's home. Let us make our communities beautiful. Earlier in the week, Mrs. Simpson Miller got an update on the Mount Rosa Bypass, which is now 80% complete. The progress report was given as the Prime Minister toured the north-south leg of Highway 2000. She was assured that work was progressing smoothly and that the road would be ready for use by August 6. Mrs. Simpson Miller welcomed the news. I am quite um, satisfied with what I saw earlier and I'm looking forward to August when, we, when I'll come to join you to declare uh, this section open and uh, I believe that when this is completed then Jamaica in this section will look like any first world country in the world. 
On the weekend, Prime Minister Portia Simpson Miller left the island for the U.S. state of Pennsylvania, where she delivered the keynote address at Lafayette College's 79th commencement ceremony. Mrs. Simpson Miller also received an honorary Doctor of Public Service degree from the Liberal Arts School. And in recognition of the Prime Minister's visit, the college established a scholarship fund to enroll students from Jamaica. The scholarships will cover the full financial needs of the recipients for four years in addition to a stipend for overseas study experience. Physical education and sport has been added to the lineup of Caribbean Advanced Proficiency Examinations CAPE subjects. And Minister with Responsibility for Sport, Natalie Nita Headley, says she hopes this will help cement Jamaica as a major player in sport. This new generation of CAPE subjects will likely create a healthier Jamaica a healthier region, reduce the nation's health costs, promote a more peaceful society, reduce stress levels, create a greater pool of athletes from which to select our national teams, provide increasing opportunities for economic development, and promote the development of a new generation of professionals in the era of sport business. I see no downside. The new subjects are agricultural science, entrepreneurship, performing arts, tourism and physical education and sport. They will be rolled out for the 2014-2015 school year in September. Government has praised the island's intercollegiate sporting system for its contribution to youth athletes. The minister responsible for sport conveyed those sentiments at the recently held Jamaica Intercollegiate Sports Association annual awards ceremony. You are preparing our athletes to deal with much of what will come with their success and what will come after they have retired from active competition. You are giving our athletes opportunities to become more media savvy. You are teaching them how to invest and what to demand from their management. That is a big, big deal. And that's it for this week's Jamaica House Weekly. I am Samantha Allen. Welcome to the FSC Minute. I am Nadi Newsom. Today we explore why the FSC might place a company under temporary management. And my guest is Sonia Nicholson, Senior Director of Securities at the FSC. Welcome to the FSC Minute, Sonia. Thank you, Nadine. Sonia, recently the FSC placed a company under temporary management. What does this mean? Temporary management means that the FSC may decide to issue a notice to a prescribed financial institution indicating its intention to temporarily manage that institution from a date and time as be, be stated in the notice. And why is temporary management necessary? Temporary management is necessary because certain sections of the Financial Services Commission Act empowers the FSC to take this action if it believes that there are certain conditions which are existing in a company. Some of the conditions which may lead the FSC to assume temporary management of a prescribed financial institution are one, the, the value of the assets of the company may be substantially less than the value of its liabilities. Two, the company has given false and misleading statement to the FSC in respect of it, an application for registration or licensing, or the company has given false information to the FSC about its affairs. Or three, a receiver might have been put in place in respect of that institution. And what would happen to a company after the period of temporary management has passed? After the period of temporary management has ended, the company can be returned to its owners if a determination has been made that it can continue to be a going concern or it can be liquidated if it is determined that it is insolvent. Thank you, Sonia. My guest today was Sonia Nicholson, Senior Director of Securities at the FSC. For the FSC Minute, I am Nadine Newsom.
is the last Monday in Child Month and what better way to close out this year's observance than by hearing some plans of the Minister responsible for children. When I visit our residential care institutions, whether our children's homes or places of safety, I can see that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing under the Child Care and Protection Act. Yes, we give them three meals a day. Yes, we provide them with education by sending them to school. Yes, we provide them with security. But in my interactions with the children, I can still feel that something is wrong. There is a gap. Something is still missing. You see, it is not enough to just feed and clothe a child and give them a safe and comfortable place to live. Children need to be loved. They need to feel loved. They need access to extracurricular activities. They need to be nurtured. They need to develop self-worth and self-esteem. Yes, they need discipline, but we need to encourage them to be the best that they can be. Surely the answer simply is not to just increase the budget year after year and hope that more children will actually get served. The answer is to reorganize the childcare sector, beginning at the point of entry. This year, we have made a number of changes to our finances to improve the residential care system. These changes will be effective through A, increased capital expenditure for the upgrading of some of our state institutions, including the allocation of some of our recurrent expenditure towards significantly improving the care offered in our homes. B, ensuring that the right people with the right skills and training and attitude are in the positions to take care of our children. C, implementing co-curricular and extracurricular programs as well as training in social graces in our children's homes. D, making amendments to the legislation and regulation to enhance child care and protection. And E, strengthening and expanding the children and family support unit of the CDA to continue the rollout of our parenting seminars. We'll have to introduce the following to the sector. A new case management system as a technological upgrade to bolster our efforts to standardize and harmonize the services to our children. We also have to introduce a model care center to point the way to new standards of care. And we also have to build a therapeutic facility to cater to the needs of a significant cohort of children in care. We will also begin in this financial year a review of the licensing regime for privately operated children's homes and places of safety. The aim of this exercise is to ensure that all entities licensed to operate as children's homes and places of safety not only have the physical facilities, but are also fit and proper with staff and the requisite training and experience to offer the new standards of care that we will be insisting this year upon them. We will insist that these licensees present credible business plans to sustain the required levels of service that we expect. The best place for children is really with a family, preferably their natural family. And we must do all that we can to keep children in or return them to the care of their family. Mr. Speaker, let me be very, very clear, lest someone gets it misconstrued. I am not proposing to keep children with parents who harm or neglect them. What I'm proposing to do is help parents to become better mothers, better fathers, and fit to raise their own children. We have begun the process. This first step required us to expand the mandate of the CDA to include helping parents to become better caregivers by giving them the support they need to nurture and raise their children and effectively assume their child-rearing responsibilities. Over the past few months, Mr. Speaker, we begun construction of child-friendly spaces in police stations in selected parishes. This was a controversial move, Mr. Speaker, simply because there was some misunderstanding about what we were doing. So I want to be clear. We do not and we are not building comfortable places to lock up people's children. The truth is, Mr. Speaker, that several children interface with police stations every day. Children who are lost, for example, and sometimes they have to spend some time waiting for their parents or children's officers to come and get them. Shouldn't they be able to wait in a proper facility with good ventilation, 
comfortable and secure accommodation, suitable bathroom facilities, and perhaps books or games to reduce their level of anxiety as they pass the time. We started with four stations in the first phase, Barrett Town in St. James, Monique in St. Anne, Bridgeport in St. Catherine, and Nain in St. Elizabeth. Another four police stations are to be selected for improvement under this project in this financial year. Our goal in the Ministry of Youth and Culture in conjunction with the Ministry of National Security, Justice, Education and Health is to have one child-friendly police station per parish. The review of the Child Care and Protection Act is proceeding. We held our national consultations and received our written submissions with recommendations for amending the Act. We are undertaking a review of the Adoption of Children Act which was first introduced in 1958. It is way overdue for an upgrade. In the review, we're attempting to harmonize the Adoption Act with the Trafficking in Persons Act to help address new and emerging practices that affect the safety and well-being of our children. I'm pleased that this debate is taking place during Child Month. This is not only a very special time of year when we celebrate our children, but it is also the time when the nation makes a very deliberate effort to assess the state of the Jamaican child and how we really are all doing as leaders, parents, caregivers, teachers, to give each child a better life. Mr. Speaker, I can confidently say that the Ministry of Youth and Culture has been doing our part to work and certainly improve the lives of children in Jamaica. Sometimes, even the greatest joys bring challenge, and the children with special needs inspire a very, very special love. As we say goodbye to May and hello to June, we're looking in the face of the 2014 Atlantic hurricane season. We want to ensure that you have all the necessary information to keep you, your family, your property and community safe through the period. That's why we've engaged the services of Jamaica's leading disaster preparedness and management agency to share what they know. Your hurricane preparedness starts even before, before you, you're into, into the aspect of your hurricane watch, hurricane warning, that, that kind of thing. It starts long before that, where you're, as I said before, you're doing, doing your checks to ensure that you have adequate hurricane straps. You, from a retrofitting standpoint, you look at pruning of your trees. Um, you, look at, you look at ensuring that you have adequate supplies so you don't have a rush on the supermarket. What people normally tend to do, you run on the supermarket when you hear that we're getting a hurricane and then you find out you might get there late and there is nothing. Ensure that you have your supplies in hand and you can rotate those supplies. Ensure that you have your, you have your medical supplies. There's a lot of persons that are diabetic with a large population in Jamaica that, have, that are diabetic. You have people who, are, who suffer from respiratory problems and are asthmatic and stuff like that. Ensure that you always have those supplies. Ensure that you're your documents are protected. You don't want to end up in a situation where you don't have all your school certificates and you're unable to, to probably go, when you're going out for an interview, you can't, you can't locate them. Ensure that you always have adequate fuel in your car. I know, it, I know fuel is expensive, but ensure that you do have that because you might, you might have to do some kind of emergency movement uh, after the system. Do your, your general checks, ensure that you're your windows are properly secured, your doors are properly secured. You don't want to have those, those go. Um, ensure that you, you, do, you talk to your neighbor and you, you develop some kind of um, 
response activity with your neighbor because sometimes the first person that will come to your aid is actually your neighbor. So, so these, these are some of the things that people should consider um, before, before the system. It keeps our bodies working. Our food nutritious, our living and working spaces clean and our lives comfortable. Water, the most precious resource necessary for the sustenance of life on our planet. Don't waste it. Let's conserve on this critical commodity. In the house, invest in storage containers and buckets. Take quick showers instead of long baths and invest in water efficient shower heads, toilets and faucets. You may also want to consider one-pot meals and cooking methods that don't require much water. You could also wash fruits and vegetables in a bowl and reuse the water on your plants or grass. When cleaning dishes, fill both sinks and use one for washing and the other for rinsing. The leftover water can be used to wash off the concrete or asphalt in your yard. If you must wash your car at home, aim for once a fortnight and use a bucket to do the washing instead of running the hose. Don't delay. Start your water conservation practices today. And that's how we draw the curtains down on today's edition of Jamaica Magazine. Be sure to keep in touch. Email us, jamaicamagazine at jis.gov.jm or send us a direct message on Twitter at JIS News. If browsing is more your style, visit our website, jis.gov.jm or our Facebook page. Join us again tomorrow, same time, same station, for more of the government's work towards making your life full. I'm Adrian Atkinson, pleasant viewing. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.